Hello everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're excited that you're joining us this evening. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we're coming at you live here from Hoss Tools headquarters in Norman Park, Georgia. We've got a great show planned today. We're going to do some yep. show and tell, some tool of the week. And uh, we're also going to talk about our, our demo garden at the Sunbelt Expo and answer some of your questions. Yep. And um, you peeling something over there? Yeah. Um, I used to have some pear trees, but mine died, got fire blight and died. So my neighbors got one that's pretty loaded over there. So I, before they got home from work, I snuck over and got me a few. I love pears. Now, I hope they don't watch the show because I got me, you know, a pretty good video. But ever since my dog killed the chickens, we ain't been getting along real good. But I, I didn't figure they would mind. I didn't ask, but I didn't figure they'd mind. So I went over and got me a few pears. And uh, this pear here is the old kind of pear that we used to grow. It's a hard pear. It's made for canning. It's not the soft pear that you buy in, buy in a grocery store. These old varieties are very hard, but they are a lot better to me. They have a little different texture to be a lot better to me than the newer softer well we call them the bartlett type pear but these old cannon pears are hard but they do have some good flavor and pears are coming in right now and pears are one of my favorites pears and figs is on the top of my list yeah figs is about my figs is about done um uh, we had a good crop those pears right there make really good cobbler Ooh. and uh Tarts. Tarts. You find somebody that knows how to make a tart. The two we used to have, we called them hard tack pears. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, which is my daddy, was over here at Triminal one day and had a heart attack Triminal. And he barely made it through it, but he did. And uh, well, ever since then, we called them heart attack pears. Yeah, we, those are some good making pear yep. trees. Now you got to, with the pears, you got to keep them picked. If you let too many of them fall on the ground, you're going to have flies and yeah, yeah. insect problems. And, and you get fire blight's a terrible problem. We Just a few years ago, we didn't have this problem, but fire blight moved in here and it has wreaked havoc on our pear trees in the last few years. And uh, I was going to show everybody some of my okra here. This is some of my jambalaya. And now I've, I've got two sections of okra planted, two successions going right now. One of them is the one I planted in spring. And um, that one is getting about, it's taller than my head, so it's over six foot tall. And I'm about ready to just chop those down. Now that was your first plant, correct? That was my first plant. So the one I planted in spring uh, um, that I transplanted, they're about six, seven foot tall now almost too tall to pick it's getting big now they making really well but um when they get that big they get a little i ain't gonna get on a ladder to cut okra no and so i've got some more coming along that's about knee high and usually the jambalaya starts making by then i don't know if the heat's just keeping it from blooming as much but uh it ain't quite started making yet but uh as soon as it does i'm gonna take some loppers and get rid of those uh tall ones and just go with the little ones. And I'll probably do one more succession here in the next So you got some red okra growing? Yeah, there? this is the um, the Carmine Splendor. And then this is the, um, the uh -oh, jambalaya. I here. found a bad spot. Uh-oh. I'm going to work around that. And the lady, since we're talking about the expo today, a lady at the expo last year showed me you can eat this. Here I am going to eat something on the yeah. show. Eat this okra raw, that's pretty good. Well, you know, I don't know that I've ever done that. And try? Not yet. <laughs> All right. And um, just to give y'all some updates, we still are planning to do an interview with Bruce Frazier here. Um, we'll be in Chattanooga early next week. Going to shoot that, and then we'll air it on one of our uh, Row by Row shows. Don't know if it'll be next week's show or the next week, but stay tuned for that. Um, I also, a little small segue, wanted to quickly address something. So if you saw our two minute tip yesterday, we uh, talked about controlling squash bugs and uh, talked about, you know, having a spraying program, having an IPM or integrated pest integrated management. Integrated pest management, which is a term that's been around for quite a while now. And it basically means just doing a good job managing your pest. Yeah, and it it, it is that term is used a lot in the organic community because you're using some chemical controls and some mechanical controls. So and biological and and biological. Um, and the mechanical controls could involve anything from hand removal to shade cloth 
or uh, insect netting. Anyway, so we had a lot of people that seemed to be confused on the difference between a squash vine borer and then a squash bug, which is what we were talking about in the video. Well, the squash vine borer is a uh, what we call Lepidopteran larva. Mm. So Lepidoptera is the family of moths and butterflies. I'm glad you had to say that. And, <laughs> and um, the, their caterpillars are the ones that, those are what they call squash vine borers, and they'll bore into the stem and uh, basically destroy the plant. As opposed to a, a squash bug, which is... Uh, in a different family of insects and uh it it feeds on the fruit and the plant but it, it just kind of injects its saliva in there it has what we call a piercing mouth part that's right mm -hmm. so we have to con you, you have to look at these two insects differently and you have to uh you have to understand that they feed differently so you have to go after them a little different with your organic natural pesticides yeah and, and one of the facebook groups uh I follow not a road by road group. Somebody on there was suggesting using BT for squash bugs. BT is not going to do anything for squash no. bugs. Now for your vine borer, it will work because BT only works on those caterpillars and worms. Yeah, they have to ingest that. So yeah. if you can catch them in a stage so they're feeding on a leaf and they ingest that, then you get good results. Nemo will work on both of them. Right, right. So you, for your squash bugs, you want to stick with the Nemo, your pyrethrin and some mechanical removal there. All right. Um, for our tool of the week this week, I kind of wanted to revisit last week's tool of the week and show everybody as we start to talk about the Expo. We're starting all our seeds at the Expo. And this here is a flat of zinnias that we got here. These are the Benary Giant ones. And I just want to show you guys how good a job these trays do of uh, growing out these plants here. Now these are what, about 10 days old? I think I seeded them. They're not that old. I, seven days? Yeah, something like that. Seven days old, and you can see how how uh, how big they are. They have not been fertilized yet, but we're going to probably start hitting them today with some 20, 20, 20. So the hot weather helped us get germination quick, and we yeah. kept them wet. Yeah, we don't have to use any heat mats this time no. of year. <laughs> uh, once they start putting on some true leaves, that's when we'll use our little brass siphon mixer, shoot some fertilizer to them. You want to keep them, you don't want them to get too dry, but you don't want to get them too wet either. No, and let's kind of, if we can, let's show the bottom here a little bit. The great thing about these flats here is they have really good drainage. Anytime that you have a plant standing in water, you're asking for some disease problems. And that's what's really good about these right here is they drain well. Yeah. Now you have to keep them watered a lot, but they do drain well, so you're not setting yourself up for some disease, some soil-borne diseases there, because you don't want that to stay wet all the time. So these drain well. We put ours on hardware cloth so the water can run you know, right out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and drainage is really important, and also when you go to water these things, really important to have a nice, soft nozzle, one that's not going to beat down your plants too well, because these stems... And early stages can be a little delicate. Yeah. You want nice, soft uh, mist on them. Yeah, we use some of the Dram products, which I'm a big fan of uh, for our watering in our greenhouse. And, it, and we use our siphon mixer. And I actually went out this morning and got us some 20, 20, 20 ready in a bucket so we can start siphoning that into our water system to start hitting those. If you don't start at this stage here, you can get some leggy plants. So you want to hit them with that fertilizer so they get real nice and full and they grow off pretty quick. Yes, and so as our, we've got a lot more stuff started that's just starting to uh, come up in the greenhouse. As that stuff grows, we'll be glad to show you that throughout the weeks. Um, the, the awesome thing about those trays right there, you don't have to step them up. Almost everything you can plant directly from that, that cell size, right. which is nice. Um, okay, so getting into the meat of today's show, we want to talk about... Um, a project we do every year called the Hoss Sustainable Living Center. Mm -hmm. And this is a part of a bigger event called the Sunbelt Expo, uh, which is located not six or seven miles from where our headquarters is here, right up the road here in Norman Park or Moultrie, Georgia. And uh, the Expo was started in 1964, but we've only been doing the Hoss SLC 
Uh, this will be our fourth year. We started in 2014. Yeah, it actually 14. started in Tiffany at the RDC up there, and then a few years later it moved down to Moultrie to a abandoned or an old World War II air base. And the air base was used to train fighter pilots back in World War II. So they took the Sunbelt Expo and had a good bit of agricultural land down there too. I think it's around 600 acres total. And they put a research farm there, and they got these huge runways that they used for most of the uh, vendors to set up. So we visited with them a few years ago, I think around 2013, and we pitched the idea to them that let's start a small garden down there area so that we can have a hands-on hands garden area where people could actually see and it could be interactive. They could see, we could demo tools, we could let people come out and see things that were growing. They could use the tools, the tillers, and things like that and get an idea of what would work for them. And it's worked out really well. Now, we've had our challenges with it. The thing about that place down there is flat, it's flat as a pancake, the whole thing. So it doesn't drain real good. So if we get a lot of rain, we have our challenges down there. And it is an old Air Force base, and it was really compacted soil. So we've had to add copious amounts of compost to try to build things up. And we've got it in pretty good shape and, and we do okay with it, but we do have our challenges. And everything we do down there is for three days a year. We'll start down there. We've already started, but we'll start working down there every day and we'll have everything coming along. And everything we do is for those three days, which is October 16th, 17th, and 18th of this year. That's right. And so um, the just a little more background, the, the expo traditionally it centers around large scale commercial agriculture. We wanted to come in there and, and provide something for the, the, the average person who didn't right. farm a thousand acres or so. Um, and we used to do, several years ago, we used to do several, quite a few trade shows a year. But as, as we get busy and we do more of this, do fewer trade shows. This is kind of our only opportunity if you want to come out and meet us, talk with us. We have a you know a garden in person. You can demo the tools. Um, a lot of people like to come out there and just talk to us. Yeah, we talked about tillers last week, and uh, Daly from Tennessee is going to be down and have BCSs and some grillos out there that you can come out and look at those BCS and grillo tillers. If you want to use one, he'd be happy to go out and let you you know demo and see which one fits the bill for you. So there's a lot going on there. I mean, all these different varieties you can look at that you may not grown before. You can walk around. It's really neat. 85,000 people attend this thing in a three-day period, and we know that one-third of all American households have some type of food garden. So a lot of people are interested in our garden. We get a lot of good feedback. People like to come through there and see what's going on. Yeah, and we've got uh, several volunteers that help us out there that are very knowledgeable about garden. So if you just want to stop by and talk about the garden, uh, it's a great opportunity to come check and it out. And for those that can't attend, a little later on, get closer to the show, we're going to be doing some things, showing out there what is going on. If you can't attend, kind of give you a little bit of, uh, of what we are doing. So Yeah, we'll be... Uh, some of our two minute tips and our other weekly videos as things start cranking out there we'll start uh doing more of those out there you know the weird thing is, is we do some we do some crazy things out there sometimes because we like to try new things that uh and sometimes they work sometimes they don't most of the time they do but we try some crazy things out there and it's challenging because we're growing crops in the fall we have a lot of insect pressure but we have grown some very nice lettuces out there in the uh in the late summer yeah the one of the uh the the the, the things that we when we first started the first couple of years we tried to have a theme out there but the last couple of years we, we kind of learned that we can't always promise a theme because that so this place this how big is that plot half an acre the garden uh, maybe close to it count the building surrounded by several hundred acres of research farm makes it tough to grow anything sustainably there in addition to the flat land and so we always have to start in the greenhouse at least twice as many plants as we think we're going to use. We uh, we kind of kid ourselves, but we always have plan A, plan B, and plan C because we normally end up using a little bit of plan B and C out there because we're going to have some failures. Yeah, and a couple years ago we had a bad Wi-Fi problem and we even got to plan D yeah. uh, in some cases. So um, the, some stuff over the years we've learned not even to try to grow there and then we've got some stuff we know does really well there. And um, so what we do every year, when it gets around 
July or so, I don't know how well you can see this on camera because it's so white, but we have a, a layout and this thing's kind of laid out like your garden is mm -hmm. uh, with pathways and many different little subplots. Now the mm -hmm. subplots are different sizes here. Uh, we've got some longer plots, some more square, and, and we keep this thing rotated pretty well. We don't ever plant the same family in the same spot every year. And uh, so we'll go through here and roughly um, just list out what we want to plant in each crop. And this year, so we're doing, uh, we did fall sweet corn for the first time last year. It worked well. And it worked well. So we're going to do that again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, I won't say the theme, but the new thing we're trying this year is the fall potatoes, mm -hmm. which as soon as we get back from Chattanooga, we'll be planting those. Yep. Um, be interested to see how that works out. So we'll keep you updated on the fall potatoes. If they don't work, we'll scrap it and plant something else there. We don't have a bare plot, but... Uh, at least we're gonna try that. Yeah, I got my, I think it's gonna work. I think it's gonna be a little bit challenging. The biggest thing I worry about with potatoes, if it does turn off wet, cause they can rot in the ground. As long as it don't turn off wet, I think we're gonna be okay on this. Yeah, we might have to elevate the yeah. soil a little bit when we plant them just to keep them dried out a little bit. Um, the, the things that do really well down there, uh, broccoli does really well. Kale, the Toscano kale or the mm -hmm. Lacinato kale, Swiss chard, is a little aggravating a transplant, but man, it does. For, for whatever reason, the white flies don't really bother. They don't bother Swiss chard. So if you got a white fly problem, you still want to grow some greens, you need to try that. And uh, we've done sweet potatoes in the past down there. Yep. They seem to do really well. Yep. Um, we did the Asian green mixes, the sour, salad green mixes last year. Mm -hmm. And um, we made a video on that. Those did really well. Those only take 21 days. That was amazing to me. We could we took a little bitty plot down there and we did these 20 inch elevated raised beds and we grew these microgreens in there. And the amount of greens that we cut off that thing was just amazing to me. Yeah. So, and, and I don't believe we had any pest or disease pressure on, on any of that. And we, at least three or four harvests we got off there is very, very bountiful for, for the yep. area. Um, we did Brussels sprouts for the first time last year. Yep. Now those, those work. Now a lot of this stuff isn't, the timing's difficult. It's not ready to harvest the show, but it's usually close. Yeah. And we did the purple cauliflower, which was really pretty. Hopefully, we started those a little earlier this year. Hopefully we got some purple heads we can show everybody this year. And um, like you said, the lettuce, the lettuce does good down there. Okra always does good there. Because it's so wet down there, because we had to have so many plants, we don't direct seed much. We direct seed the corn. We have direct seeded some peas in the past, but we transplant almost everything down there just because it can be so wet and, and the disease pressure and everything. Yeah, and our time, it just works out, but we can manage it better in the greenhouse than we can down there, so. Yeah, so um, transplanting is our best option down there. You know, we grew tomatoes down there when you grew a variety called Red Bounty, and they did okay, but the threat pressure in the fall is so tough that we kind of abandoned that. Uh, peppers and tomatoes just don't do well for us down there. Uh, with the threat pressure that we have that time of the year. And you have to keep in mind, you know, this is a research farm. So they're letting some of the crops go out there and uh, they are trying some different things out there to see what controls. So they're not getting hundred percent control out there either. And we're getting some of that from that. So we'll get some of that insect pressure from, so from some of the research they're doing. So it can be tough. And in with, in with that, uh, the squash, it's tough to grow squash down there. Yeah, we grew the winter squash one year, we grew pumpkins one year, and they actually got by with it. They did pretty good, but we tried it next year and it was a complete failure and we had to scrap that. So we're not going back with pumpkins or winter squash. And I would love to grow winter squash down there because they are, are so so good to grow and, and everybody loves them, but we just can't grow them down there. With the, the powdery mildew, the white fly pressure, the downy pressure, it's just nearly impossible. We were able to get a decent crop of Seminoles and the Georgia Bulldogs, but they're more adaptable. Yeah. But, but the you know regular old winter squash uh, had a time with. Yeah, white flies. That particular year, the white flies was bad, and they just ate us up. Yeah, we couldn't do anything about them. So 
uh, October 16th through the 18th. Yep. Plan to come see us at the expo. and uh, we got a big sign up there that says Hoss Tools Sustainable Living Center. And, uh, and I forgot what gate is it on. Gate 3? Gate 3. Gate 3. And um, so there's a big pavilion there called the Georgia Metals yep. Pavilion that they built for us. And we've got exhibits in there. And we've got the big demo garden. We've got a little tool shed out there. We've got our products kind of strode everywhere along there that you can try them out. Uh, really big event only three days a year and like i said we don't do any shows anymore this is it um there's plenty to do there besides us these food vendors there's every tractor manufacturer i know that's out there is there and most of those have uh you know tractors that you can look at talk to fill up kick and find out if you're in the, if you're in the market for one of those or any type of implement you can think of is out there so there's a lot going on yeah i think in the last couple of years they even put in a a side-by-side -side demo track where you can test out your you know your yamahas or your rangers or any of that so that's pretty neat yep. too all right so uh, come check us out at the expo and now let's get into some questions from last week's show and uh if we do answer your question as always put your questions in the comments we'll answer them next week's show if we do answer your question send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com and you'll be the recipient of one of these nice little koozies here. All right, so let's get into these questions here. And the first one is from Wayne Phillips. And uh, Wayne wants to know how many feet or rows can he run from one header of drip tape or one section of main line? Hmm. And um, that's going to depend on your flow rate. So the way it works, Wayne, is you first want to calculate your flow rate. Yeah, don't don't let this get complicated because it's really not. Uh, this can easily be done, but it's something that you're gonna have to make your mind you gotta do. Yeah, so go out to your garden, take your phone, it's got a stopwatch on it, get you a five gallon bucket, and time how long it takes you to fill up that five gallon bucket. That's gonna give you your flow rate, okay? So you can figure out how many gallons per minute you're yep. putting out. If it takes you a minute to fill up that bucket, your flow rate is five gallons a minute. If it takes you 30 seconds to fill up that bucket, which is what it is at my house, you've got about 10 gallons a minute. So once you've got that flow rate, then you can figure out how much drip tape you can support at one point in time. At a flow rate of five gallons a minute, you can support up to 1,250 feet of tape at one time. Yeah, I like to go a little under that. I don't like to stretch it out to the max. So my, my recommendation would be around 1,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Now, with, our, with the main line we sell, which is a 5 8 main line, it will only support rows up to 100 foot long. In length. In length. Now, say I got a 200 foot garden. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can run a header line on the top end, and you can run a header line on the back end, and you can run your continuous tape there if mm -hmm. you wanted to. And you could feed it from both directions, or you could run your uh, uh, header line at the top end, and you could go 100 feet down and run your another header line. Mm -hmm. So just because you've got longer than 100 feet, there is ways around that. Or you could run your main line in the middle, split them off both directions. Yeah. But just keep in mind, 100 foot with the trunk line that we have is is the feathers you can run that tape in one direction right and then you, if, if you if you've got more drip tape than your system can support at one time you can put those valves and yeah. stuff on there yeah. put it in sections whatever um so if you you've got a flow rate of five gallons a minute about a thousand feet of tape which is you know usually enough for most folks if you've got 10 gallons a minute you know two over two thousand feet of tape so yeah whatever you got we can we can work with you to help you design a system that'll work for you yeah if you ever have any questions you can always send us a picture of your garden and we'll help you figure it out yep all right and then the last question we have is from troy hansen and uh troy is in idaho and has got clay soil and says tough to work with and uh, wants to know is there anything he can add to kind of improve the composition of the soil and make it more workable? Yeah, there's clay soils. Now, we don't have clay soils, but I have a lot of friends that do, and I've been in a lot of areas that, uh, that were heavy clay soils, and they can be aggravating. They can be hard to deal with, and I can understand the frustration that you have there, Troy. Now, here's a couple of things I'd recommend. Of course, a lot of compost. You know, always add organic matter compost, and that's going to help. But another thing you can do is add limestone or gypsum. 
and that can also be it's a calcium source but it also can be used as a soil conditioner so check around if you're in an agriculture area or you're close to an agriculture area check around and see if you have land plaster is one name for it or gypsum available if you do get you some of that incorporate it into your garden that will help with your soil structure a lot now your rate on the gypsum and the land plaster as a soil conditioner is around 150 pounds per thousand square feet so it takes a lot of it so it's going to be hard to order that and have it shipped over the internet you could do that but it's going to be kind of tough if you're using it as a soil conditioner you need to find a source for it that you can go pick it up get a truck load yeah up. so if you had a 50 by 50 garden that's 2500 square feet mm -hmm. so to add gypsum or land plaster there as a soil conditioner you know you're looking at 450 pounds right so that would be what I would recommend is heat it with some gypsum land plaster and also add as much good compost as you can and get that soil built up. And it'll work for you. Clay soils are actually very good because they hold nutrients real well. Mm -hmm. But they can be aggravating to work with. Yeah. Uh, another thing I would suggest is, is, is incorporate as much organic matter as possible. Maybe grow you some tillage radishes out there, those things. Yep. Uh, tillage radishes, field peas work really good any high density crop like that that you can just grow and then till it into the soil and get some organic matter build up um, increase your drainage a little bit yeah uh, should help with that yeah anytime you can add good organic matter whether it be through cover crops or through compost is a win-win that's right that's right all right so uh, thank y'all for this question send us an email we'll get that koozie out to you and uh, that's going to do it for today's show and on next week's show, we're going to talk about the history of the wheel hoe a little bit. Now, Which is very interesting. The wheel hoe was kind of our claim to fame. And we're going to kind of go way back in the record books and talk about how it all started and then maybe how, how we started with it. Yep. All right. So I hope you join us next week. We'll see you then. All right. Take care.